Good evening. Hello, Sarah. How are we? So good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to this week's 120 Dublin Stories with Santa Rita and the Little Museum. Um, this week, I'm absolutely delighted um, to be joined by Carla Marriman Funder, the Chief Executive of the National Print Museum. Carla, thank you so much for being here. No problem. Thank you for inviting me here. Very happily. I'm an enthusiastic fan and I'm looking forward to um, learning more and hearing more this evening. Um, so as always, to everyone who's going to join in with us, um, if you've got questions as we're going along, please do type them in and we'll make our way through them over the course of the evening. But Carla, I'd love you just to start us off and to set the scene. Um, like bring us all the way back to the beginning when the National Print Museum was being set up and just tell me a little bit about how it came to exist. Well, I suppose if we write, we wind back to the um, kind of 1960s, there were huge advancements in printing technology, like unprecedented changes. And a lot of the equipment was becoming redundant. And in many cases, the newspapers and the printing houses were throwing out this equipment. Um, like we were just so lucky that there was a group of compositors and printers that valued that equipment. Um, that had the foresight to start collecting that equipment and that also um, had this wonderful idea to imagine up a national museum of printing. Uh, they were spearheaded by a man called Sean Galvin and they initially got space in the union offices on Gardner Street, okay. uh, kind of a Georgian building, not ideal for housing these massive machines weighing tons. Um, and, um, they, that was kind of in the early 90s then when they managed to acquire the space at Beggar's Bush Barracks where we're still housed today. And uh, there was a lot of work needed on that building, um, Office of Public Works own building, and with a lot of support from the printing industry, um, the newspapers and so on. And we opened the National Print Museum in 1996. It was the then president, Mary Robinson, who opened um, the, the museum. And yes, it will be heading for our 25th birthday next year and um, the, the building that we're in it's the, the old chapel of the beggars bush barracks and um, so it's a, a nice vast open space um, to, to, to display our collection but we only have about 30 percent of the collection on display there okay and it's funny actually now that you say that because a question that I had in the back of my mind to ask you was is your location in beggars bush particularly important to the um to the museum, but I never even thought of the physical weight constraints that your collection presents. Um, yeah, so I think that was a big part of, of housing us. Um, there is a nice connection that the stationer's office was held there at one point in the barracks. Um, but yeah, no, it's not it's not uh, specific to um, to print history. Um, uh, it was it was very much what was available at the time to us. Yeah. Okay, and like so then if you're saying 30% of your collection is on display, that means that there's obviously quite a significant collection that we don't see on a daily basis when we come in to visit yourselves. Like, could you kind of paint us a little bit of picture of, you know, the span of pieces within your collection? Yeah, so our collection would mainly be printing equipment and printing tools and then the type and uh, it's always hard to know when you're doing a virtual uh, talk as who the audience is so uh, in terms of pitching if, if I'm if I'm describing things too basic or people want an explanation of things just pop it in the chat there but type what I'm referring to there is um, the, the pieces of a metal type or wooden type that would have been assembled composed to create um, text and that's the type of printing that we're talking about so just to to to, to um, say we're concentrate on letterpress printing so taking you back to uh, like your school days that that's um, the invention of Johannes Gutenberg, um, one of the greatest inventions of all time. Um, so that's the type of printing that we focus on. And it was the way printing was done for over 500 years. So it's quite a significant type of, of printing. So yeah, our collection would largely be equipment based um, and it would also have a small archival collection um, of posters, printed ephemera. And then we have a great uh, library of kind of like technical manuals to do with the machines, type specimen books and so on. So 
um, it's quite a specific collection. Um, the storage facility, yeah, is jam packed and it's quite sad that we don't have a, enough of the, the equipment on display. And that's part of our kind of, I suppose, our bigger plans, which we might get into a little bit later. Um, but the collection itself is uh, what you'll see. It's, it's actually laid out like a traditional print shop. So it's not like a museum where everything is behind glass or behind rope. It's very much a working museum. And that's really exciting um, to go into a space that is created around function rather than just about interpretation or chron uh, a chronological order. Um, from my point of view, as someone um, managing a collection like that, it can be really challenging. Um, so you have additional factors such as health and safety to uh, take into account. Um, you've also got like a really interesting um, kind of theme around conservation and how we can search conserve this type of collection um, and I suppose for me I find that one of the really interesting things about my job um, because you know most museums um, you'd be taking out the white gloves to put on the object to, to, to care for the objects or, or, or whatever and in our collection we're like using the collection and um, I suppose that's challenging in some ways and I know like a good few years ago we had a call from the National Museum and they were bringing their whole conservation team over for a tour of the National Museum, or the National Print Museum. And I was terrified. I was thinking, what are they going to make of our approach to conservation? Um, like they're hardly drinking from the Arda chalice or playing their illin pipes over there. And I, you know, I was terrified and I couldn't believe how supportive they were of our approach. And of course, it's not haphazard. What we do is very much thought out, very much in keeping with best past practice standards and um, so what we would do is we would take a machine if we were going to print from it and we would do a full review with a conservator and um, we did that um, for with one of our machines when we were doing a big print job in 1916 and um, we found that that machine at the Wharfdale stop cylinder press it in its heyday would have printed something like 13.5 million pages in a year. So by us printing a couple of hundred pages, we were going to do minimum wear and tear damage. And in some cases, actually keeping these machines working um, and running them is actually really good for the machine and and our more idle machines are the ones that are actually more problematic and um, so I suppose it's it's a really interesting collection from that point of view that it's um it's being constantly used and I suppose our job is how we can continue to facilitate that use of the collection and so we not only conserve the objects we're also conserving the craft and um, mm. and that's the craft of letterpress printing so that's, I suppose, for us, something um, that's challenging. The printers that we have that work at the museum, they're printers and compositors. They're all over 70 in age. And the skills that they have are ones that they would have learned on a seven year apprenticeship from the age of 13, and then all their life serving their whole time in the printing industry. And how we can try and teach those skills um, it's really challenging and it's not only their skills it's also their stories um and i think so they're the ones you should probably have on this in on this uh, uh series and um, that's another whole area so we're yeah we're not just displaying artifacts we're, we're telling stories around those machines as well and that i i think is kind of a it, it's fascinating to think like i know as a museum attendee I always enjoy the experiences where I'm told to be tactile and interactive. And, you know, as you said, there you, you're not going to ever find the day where you're sitting there drinking from the Arja Chalice. But, you know, these interactive moments do really bring experiences to life and really kind of help kind of, kind of illuminate the visit for us as, as guests. But it's interesting to think or to listen to you talking about conservation, how that applies to the physical pieces but also the tradition and the skills that go alongside. And like for in saying that, you know, that you're looking at how many times a year certain machines can be used and kind of ways that you can meet good conservation practice while enabling the skills to continue. Like the 1916 story that you kind of, 
you alluded to there, I, I remember hearing it back in 2016 and thinking it was fascinating. Could you just tell us a little bit about the backstory there? Yeah, so um, I suppose that was a great year for, for us in, in the sense that uh, we got an opportunity to tell the story of not only um, the role that print played in a very important moment in Irish history, but also the role of printers. Um, many of the printers also actually fought. Um, and then there were the printers that actually produced the printed product. And um, for us, we did a number of um, commemorative projects that year from, uh, we did um, special tours for schools and we did an exhibition, The Legacy of Seditious Types, The Legacy of Printers in 1916. It's actually a very good online exhibition that we did of that, um, the printers of 1916.com it is. And it was really interesting to see the different printed material and, and, and what that um, told us. But obviously the star of the show was the 1916 proclamation. So at the National Print Museum mentioned earlier, we have a wharf Dell stop cylinder press. So that's the type of machine that would have been used to print the proclamation. It's not the machine. We don't know what happened to that, but it's the only fully operational one that we know of in Ireland. Um, and um, it was a huge task to try and get that machine up and running. And um, we had a lot of support from the industry and from the Heritage Council as well um, in getting that machine up and running. And what we did was we have three printers, um, Alice McCormick and Billy Ryan, who are since deceased, and Freddie Snow. And the three of them worked tirelessly on this uh, project. And they managed to print replica 1916 uh, proclamations, like under every single circumstance that you could imagine. It was printed to the day, the 23rd of April, 2016. Um, there were three of them, just like there were in the original um, printing. It would have been two compositors and a printer, uh, Christopher Brady. And um, they had the same size paper. They they just went to so much effort to ensure um, the, uh, the the replica was done to the highest standards. As printers, they strive for perfection, and I had to stop them from trying to correct the original printer's mistakes, <laughs> um, because we wanted it as authentic as possible. Um, and I suppose for us, the, the proclamation is the country's most uh, famous um, and most important historic document and to have the type of machine it was printed on is a wonderful way of being able to demonstrate just how the document was printed and the challenges that they ran into trying to print it so they obviously had to do it in secrecy and with limited resources. They were very experienced compositors and printers and would have worked on James Connolly's um, The Irish Workers' Republic newspaper. Um, so they had quite a lot of experience with this kind of thing. Um, but uh, printing the proclamation into the speed and with the limited resources really challenging. So the main thing that they were missing was type. And um, so they didn't have the letters to, to print it. And um, they borrowed type. I think a lot of it came from uh, Henry West and Cable Street, who was an Englishman. Um, and they had, um, yeah, real challenges here. So when you look through the document, and obviously I don't have it in front of me here, so it's hard to explain. Um, but um, you'll see if you look at it, there's different typefaces throughout. There's different size typefaces. Um, and what they had to do is they had to print it in two halves. So they set the type, printed it, and then they had to like reuse that type and print it again. And um, so actually when the soldiers, British soldiers came in, um, the second half was on the press, the second half of the type, and they pulled some prints of that. So there are some existing half proclamations. I know, um, uh, the Pierce Library definitely have one, and I think the National Library have one as well. Um, but um, yeah, it's just so fascinating. So our guides will talk you through, like line by line, the different curiosities of the document. And we have huge respect for what the printers and compositors did, but we do point out one mistake that they made. <laughs> um, we, we don't fa fail to point that out. But yeah, it was a huge undertaking to uh, print that proclamation. Um, we did like a limited edition of them, a uh, hundred of them that filled out before the day, which put extra pressure on the printers and the machine. Mm -hmm. um, and um, then we did an unlimited edition that you can continue to buy from the shop and get your own piece of, of history. And I, I think, 
personally, I think in, in those instances, as you said, kind of commenting on the curiosities of the piece, I often think that those backstories and the kind of the reality of what the experience is like is what brings a piece to life and really helps you to get the insight into what the day in the life was like in the moment that the document came into existence and what the reality of lining the press must have been like. Um, yeah. But I kind of wonder, so, you know, in, in talking about that printing press, you're talking about one of the most historically significant documents in all of Ireland. And I wonder, would you have on a smaller level, would there be something more local and anecdotal as an artifact in your collection that you're particularly fond of that maybe is not historically significant but has a nice social or human story behind it? Like we've so many different uh, um, machines and yeah, I sometimes think kind of juxtaposition of ones that were used for like really historic, like the, the Wharfdale that I mentioned there, that like was also used to print Women's Way magazine in the Monument Press in Bray. Uh, the one that we have was used by the Nina Guardian. And um, so like, it's just so interesting to think of the different outputs that these machines had and their significance. Um, we've machines that would have printed um, Guinness bottle labels we have a machine that a nun ran in, in the sisters of assumption that they would have used for like mass booklets and memorial cards all sorts of different things i think one of my favorites um and I'm supposed to go from our biggest to our smallest uh, machine in the collection and um, the adana printing presses a lot of people would know about those and um, they are small hobbyist printing printers people would have had at home or with small businesses and they would have done things like christmas cards or business cards um, and um, i think what i love about them is that like the social history of of um what what people printed at home and i love we have so many of them our stores is almost breeding um adana's um but we love the stories that they come with and what people tell us that they used to print on these and yeah i think there's like definitely an exhibition in that as well and um, so yeah i would think that um one of those and also it's something that i can operate uh, that's probably why i'm picking it because um i'm not a printer as i may have mentioned earlier so yeah that's one of the machines that i i have mastered <laughs> It's um, yeah, it, it's funny because when you're talking about kind of domestic and home use, um, I know we've got a very small little printing board in the Irish Times room of the little museum in one of our exhibitions. And um, there's an area where guests can print their own headline. And there could be days where you'll see a four year old or a 40 year old sitting there for a good 10, 15 minutes, kind of meticulously stamping out their headlines. And it's just it can lead to some really gorgeous moments but um yeah we can totally relate to that like we would do some printing with everyone that comes to the museum it's such a hands-on participatory uh, participatory experience and like that seeing people print their name for the first time it's just it's magical to watch it and your job like and as you say it's kids it's adults it's everyone and then you see the adults coming back oh could I do one for my grandchild and you know they just want another go at it um but yeah it's it's it really makes it so real and um I think demonstrating an object just adds enormously to our understanding of that object and um its significance as well so yeah we're very much in favor of that kind of um demonstration approach to interpretation. And I, when we're talking about the impact that printing has had on the world, really, um, like kind of the introduction of the wonders of the web and all things online are quite a new advancement. And um, you know, in, in the time before someone could send a tweet and communicate to millions of people in a moment, you know, printing was, it kind of was one of the most influential discoveries in the entire world in terms of the ability to disseminate information. Yeah, definitely, um, without a doubt. Uh, so yeah, the print, printing it goes back to Gutenberg's invention in, in, in 1439 and it was without a doubt one of the greatest inventions. I think the one accredited before that would have been the wheel 
feel. Um, so uh, it's just like unimaginable and um, I think it allowed for the spread of information as you said the spread of ideas theories religion science communication and um, propaganda and um, it just to think of a society without print is yeah it's unfathomable I suppose um, and um, I think that's a really big uh, job for us at the print museum I think when I started going to the print museum I noticed when I started working there I started noticing that we used to say to visitors when they come in oh have you an interest in printing as their first question and I started realizing like why are we asking them that mm. you don't have to be a printer or a graphic designer to come to the print museum all our lives have been affected all our histories have been affected by printing and um we need, to, I suppose that's a role that we have and a responsibility we have to make the history of printing more accessible and more relevant to people. And um, I suppose that is a big challenge. And one way we've been able to do that is through our temporary exhibitions. Um, so I really feel that they're able to show the impact of print at a certain moment in history so we've talked a little bit about like 1916 and um, we've done we did an exhibition in 2018 on the it was uh, called um uh print protest and the polls and it was about the role of printed material during the suffragette campaign um and that was really interesting to see so we looked at the historical element of that and looking at postcards, posters, all of the material that was used, placards that was used to get that message across a little bit. Like you say now, if there was a campaign as such, it might be on Twitter and so on. And the, the power of the printed word and it was the only way to get the message out. We also, with that exhibition, though, looked at trying to get the contemporary relevance. And we invited three of Ireland's leading letterpress printers, um, Mary Plunkett, um, uh, Dave Darcy and Jamie Murphy. We invited them to respond to the themes of the exhibition today, well, in 2018. And that was a really interesting approach for us to think about, uh, yeah, that contemporary connection. And one of them, for example, Jamie Murphy, he directly linked into the abortion campaign and looking at women's rights that was at the time. And I suppose that's an area where, you know, you can get a little little bit nervous around but it's a really important area for museums to you know play a role and and to um share conversations and um, and be a, a platform for that and um those actually those three works are featuring in an exhibition opening in london this evening actually virtually opening uh, as we talk now so it's great to think that their message has gone on and we've done lots of other um, posters of protest and revolution and just like incredible posters over like all different um, moments in history and showing that powerful word of visual communication and uh, the, the power of the printed word but I also equally have really enjoyed doing the exhibitions of like more overlooked moments in in history so not just the punch moments um but like looking at like the everyday and one one i really loved was one we did um with a curator alan kinsler and um kieran swan uh who curated it and it was about um what was let me see what it was called uh what you may be meant to keep irish political ephemera and it was like you know around time of election and you get all that stuff thrown in your door and you get flyers and sometimes they come out with the most random bookmarks and all sorts of things. He has collected that since he was a teenager for across all parties, not in any way biased. And um, he just put on this wonderful exhibition and it happened to be around election time. So it got great interest. And it was just that like that material that like may seem throw away. And when you bring it all together, the insight it shows to um, social history. And um, I, I really find those exhibitions. We did another one on um, it was a curator, Kira Meehan, on um, modern wife, modern life. And it was the role of the Irish housewife in the 1950s and 60s. And again, like this stuff was not seen as anything important there were you know uh letters of resignation when a woman would get married she would have to leave her job there were books on like how to be a good housewife and um there was uh the housewife of the year awards and like recipes and things like this and she had a wedding dress and it was just again it was like the 
the insight that that printed material could show us um, uh, into that time. And so, yeah, I think uh, it's really important for us with our exhibitions to look at, yeah, the, the, the I suppose the big moments and the, and the lesser ones. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that kind of juxtaposition is really interesting. It's, it's fascinating though, but it's, it's amazing to see how, you know, the printing form is used as the vehicle to give insight into what's going on in society at those particular moments. It's, um, and, and it's actually, it's, it's hearing you talk about how do we look back at historic events, but also allow today an opportunity to kind of respond and to kind of present today's opinion um, or perspective on the matter like it's it's a conversation that we would have regularly in the little museum you know at what point does our role commence you know are we recording a moment after it's happened or do we engage in the dialogue when it's in progress and yeah. I guess kind of as a curatorial decision I'm kind of curious you know when yourself and your team are looking at programming temporary exhibitions and different initiatives like kind of what are your decision making factors and how do you approach that contemporary versus history narrative yeah it's definitely something i suppose that has been evolving and i think as you've really said there like museums are constantly changing like we exist in a ever-evolving world and we have to continue to grow and evolve and so our aim um one that we would have um today can you hear me okay i've just had a note to say my internet has gone you okay can you hear me yeah you're back you disappeared for a moment apologies yeah no you're you're good sorry about that Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, I think it, museums are, can you hear me now, Sarah? Perfect, absolutely. Okay, sorry about that, and hopefully I don't go again. I don't know where I left off. Did, did, where did I leave you? Um, I was just asking about your curatorial practices and the kind of decision-making yeah so yeah I, I think I was just saying that yeah that it's constantly evolving and constantly reviewing it um, and a number a few years ago maybe two years ago we did a full review of um, the museum and what 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 are we and who are we and who do we want to be and it was a really great um, experience we we thought our, our well we actually didn't have a vision so we uh, got ourselves a vision and uh, we agreed on our vision uh, to champion print and its impact on the world and then we reviewed our our mission and if I can remember right it's to promote a greater understanding of the uh, historical significance and the contemporary relevance of printing by exploring heritage craft and technology and I think that was a huge curatorial debate was whether we would go down the craft element which is where there's been a huge international revival in the craft of letterpress. Um, and that's, I suppose, what's current at the moment and what's trendy. Um, and then um, what is the other side of it is more like the technological side of things. And there's printing museums all around the world and, and they'll vary. And then we thought we can actually do everything here. Um, and I suppose temporary exhibitions let us explore that a little bit more um, in addition to our main exhibition. Um, with our temporary exhibitions, we very often work with externals. Um, we don't have a curator on our staff, we're a really, really small staff. So we have a curatorial committee, which is volunteers, um, and they we would take in proposals or we would um, commission people to work with us on exhibitions. So most of those exhibitions that I've mentioned have um, been us working with like an academic or um, a specialist in that area and um, but we're really quite open to ideas um, and we have an exhibitions policy of course but um, it's it's just there are definitely things that um, make us realize and sometimes it's not in our policy or our remit and they make us realize that there are ways that we can actually make our collection more relevant to people today um, so yeah i would say we have quite an open approach um to that um yeah i hope that answers your question no it does absolutely and i think um we ourselves in the little museum are doing a body of work at the moment on our strategy and just kind of refining what it looks like for the next 10 years because we're approaching our um, 10th birthday now in a couple of months time 
And so it's kind of looking back over the first 10 years and looking to the next 10. And um, I, I think that's always a fascinating idea to think about what the future looks like. And I think at the moment, it's kind of something that we're all really hanging on to um, is this kind of the, the glance into the future. And I kind of wonder, do you have a sense of kind of the strategy or kind of any key ambitions for the years ahead? Yeah, so I suppose as part of that whole process that I was talking about there, um, that where we um, reviewed our vision and our mission, that was all about planning for the future. So it's our strategic plan, uh, which will last until um, mid next year. And um, that was our, our, our really quite ambitious plan that we had and set ourselves our new um, values and our, our strategic aims. And a lot of that is around um, potential move that we have and I, I say that with a uh, an ounce of fear and then a big dollop of excitement and um, because we technically have our um, notice to leave Beggar's Bush next year we're hoping that we will get uh, an extension to that lease for a few years to buy us some time to um, find a better more suitable home for the British museum and maybe to be able to display more of that collection that we mentioned earlier perhaps although the beggars bush barracks is a fascinating place to be and has a really interesting history it's a little off the beaten track so obviously being in a like a more city center maybe passerby traffic would be amazing and um, so a lot of it has come down to rethinking like what the print museum could be um if we if we weren't always constrained by our four walls and that was a really big challenge Challenge because a lot of people, you know, um, would say, would, would be saying, think big picture, imagine we've no money is no obstacle, the four walls, and and just everybody found it really difficult to imagine that and um, uh, what the print museum could be without those obstacles. Um, as as for most museums, I think space and money are, are big challenges. So yeah, we had we had a good bit of fun with that process, and uh, we have ambitious plans of what we would like the museum to be, um, and this move might just very well be that opportunity for us to to see those through okay and that is it's um it's an exciting and as you said kind of terrifying prospect to kind of go okay well if everything is possible where do you start and that's yeah. um, it's 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 exciting so i'm curious and hopeful and looking forward to seeing what the next few years look like for the print museum yeah. in that regard it's i'm sure lots me of too <laughs> <laughs> lots of exciting times ahead um and so talk to me a little bit about, as you've mentioned, you've got this incredible group of printers who are really instrumental to the organisation. Just tell me a little bit about their own background and involvement. Yeah, so those printers that set up the museum are still, some of them are still very involved in the museum and uh, they would be compositors or printers and would have trained and worked their lives in the printing industry. Many of them would have come from printing families. It was very much like a printing dynasty family kind of scenario where you'd only get in if your father was a printer or if your grandfather was a printer. And it was a well-regarded trade and it was well-paid. Uh, they took their trade very seriously uh, you know, seriously and very disciplined, um, and they still are so disciplined in in their approach to volunteering at the museum. For them, it was a trade, and as I mentioned earlier, print has gone through this revival, and it's it's now a craft. Um, and for them, they are just they just love that there is such an appreciation for what they did and acknowledgement that they were craftsmen, and um, because I suppose at the time it was their job. Um, and now they realize that actually they were craftsmen, they were making history and what they did is valued so hugely. So they, you can definitely see how they buzz off meeting our visitors that have that appreciation for them or visitors from overseas that are also trying to do similar things to what we are trying to do at the Print Museum. Um, and um, they are just an incredible bunch. They're all men. We had one woman, and um, sadly she passed away this year. Um, and um, they had about 15 of them. They refer to themselves as the chapel. Um, so the chapel, it was originally um, a collective term for members of the print union, and it would have a father of the chapel. So we have the father of the chapel. It would have been Vinnie Caprani, and now it's Brendan Murphy. And he would be the one get, get, getting them all together for the various asks. And a big part of what they do at the museum is they maintain the collection. Um, 
they also demonstrate the collection usually on a regular basis but obviously with COVID that's been challenged and um, they would do be involved in training programs that we've done uh, we did a, a really strong um, training program last year skills transfer program sponsored by Creative Ireland um, and that was a fantastic way of trying to preserve their skills and pass them on to younger generations they'd also be involved in like oral history projects that we do because they're brilliant storytellers um, and uh, I don't know if it's it's the Dublin wit or if it's something specific to the printing trade they're just phenomenal storytellers and I could listen to them all day and I've learned so much from them and um, I've also learned how to have a thick skin because there's a lot of joking in that industry <laughs> um, and there's a lot of slagging and that could they have great fun and um, they're just a really great group of people to be around and um, we've, we've lost some really great printers over the last few years and it's been really sad. Um, and every time we lose a printer, um, we just realize just how pressing it is that we make as many efforts as we can to collect their knowledge, their stories, their skills and, and preserve it. Um, and I suppose that's the huge responsibility I feel with my job. Um, and I suppose not just a, like a job, you also feel it like as a civic responsibility as well. Like if, if we don't capture this, like, who is going to you know um so um it's definitely a, a big challenge but working with with that group of printers and compositors is um is is really one of the huge advantages of our job at the print museum and and um yeah it's like having a, a bunch of granddads it's it's wonderful <laughs> yeah, it's, it sounds absolutely idyllic it sounds beautiful um but i think it's, it's interesting though when you when you talk about it as kind of as a civic responsibility to kind of preserve this knowledge and to kind of enable it to continue through with future generations like what how are you finding the kind of the younger generations re re responding to this is it kind of is there a retro interest in the kind of the fun of printing or is there actually a want to see this knowledge yeah of you're so right like retro is a good word it's become very hipster and it's so funny like we've all these photos in the museum of like these ultra cool hipsters and then our retired printers and it's quite funny and um, yeah there's been a huge revival for largely for graphic designers and um, um, uh, in, in letterpress printing um, but also with people who was an interest in the art of the book and I think I don't have the answer as to why this revival came about but I do think it's an appreciation of the craft of course but it's also that kind of a digital fatigue can you hear me Sarah yeah it's it's, it's a digital fatigue and um like being fed up of digital perfection I think um and as a graphic designer I understand they feel um that by holding a piece of type if it's Times New Roman or Gil Sands, whatever it might be, that ex tactile experience of actually picking up the piece of metal type and setting it, justifying it by hand, it's just, uh, it's it's really magical and beautiful. And um, I think there are some of the reasons. Uh, there are other people that are interested from an engineering point of view. Um, you know, printing presses today don't last quite like these did, like these last 500 years, you know, they're still working. Um, and uh, yeah, there's there's many reasons why that's come about, but it definitely we get a, a lot of young people really interested in, in that. We do workshops where it's hands-on and you can actually create your own piece of experimental letterpress or it might be um, a business card or a Christmas card and um, obviously these things are paused at the moment but they're part of our um, education programming. And actually I kind of I am curious to ask you that kind of you know because we've had such a conversation about, about tactility I kind of would dare think that yourselves are in kind of a similar boat to ourselves like how is the the nature of the pandemic impacting the visitor experience now that because I'm right in thinking you reopened yesterday is that correct yes yeah so obviously the pandemic has hit museums hugely and we're in no exception to that and it's been a very challenging time with our loss of income throughout the summer months and um, I think uh, with, in, with regards to the visitor experience we want to make sure that we can create um, 
as, as much of, of the original visitor experience as we can. Um, but you're dead right, the hands-on element is very hard. So we, we obviously can't do guided tours at the moment. So we now have like a self-guided route, uh, like a map that helps you through the collection and um, uh, gives you that kind of way of exploring it and discovering it on your own. And then there is a stop off on that, which we're so glad we can continue with, um, where we have one of our colleagues is caged into um, the little workshop corner with like perspex around them and they do a live print demonstration um, and lovely little I probably shouldn't spoil the surprise but you get like um, a wash your hands poster as part of your visit um, and so they would all be like uh, pre-printed in envelopes for more than 72 hours so yeah it's all very kind of thought through and it's it, you're not getting inky you're not rolling your sleeves up but at least you can still see it live and you, as I said before it's it really helps with your understanding of um, the printing process to just see the type, the paper, the print, the ink and make that impression. So, um, and then our, our, our temporary exhibitions, they very much lend themselves to self-guided visits anyway. Um, we wouldn't usually do guided tours of those so um, that's still the same um, and then we've been exploring different ways like yourselves of um, doing like uh, virtual tours um, we did a virtual our first virtual demonstration day um, on culture night and um, that link is on on our website you can still see that and um, basically we tried to reenact the uh, what it would be like on a demo day and you go around to all the machines and you hear from all the printers and uh, hear their stories see the their machines and operation and it was amazing because we had like you know about 30 or 40 views live it was our first time doing something but now it's the, the videos have had like over 900 people watch it or something so that's fantastic for the printers to know that they can still engage with people um oh thanks so much for putting up the link there that's great um and um yeah it's uh it's really wonderful to find new ways we're also um just in the process of creating a new uh audio visual experience for schools that's a really important part of what we do and um so that will be available in the new year so yeah it's really challenging um trying to continue the visitor experience but it's also helping us to push boundaries and to rethink and reimagine the visitor experience and make improvements so um yeah the team is definitely rising to to the challenge right and i think it's it's one of those situations where we all have to hope that it'll have forced us out of our comfort zone to make changes that are ultimately in the better of the organizations in the long run however it feels to the executive at the particular moment mm -hmm. um but i think fiona's actually just put the link to your demo day in the comments there for anyone who wants to watch it as a follow-up i know it's um I, I have a call set up with my own family with people that I can't be with at the moment at the weekend. We're going to watch it together just as a, an activity. So Very good. thank you for that. Um, <laughs> and I kind of, I guess one thing I'm kind of curious about when you're talking about the individuals, you've talked to us about the different pieces of equipment and the processes and the kind of the historical, like the insight that it gives us to different parts of our history. Like, I, I kind of I don't know if this is a question to ask, but you know, do we have a sense of how the history of printing in Ireland is perceived on an international level or well, I suppose um, we were quite slow initially to take it up. So it was about a hundred years after printing was invented in, in Germany, in Mainz in Germany, that it came to Ireland. And it was uh, Humphrey Powell um, was sent over from London to Dublin to print the Book of Common Prayer. And um, some 10 years later or so, um, he was sent back to print it in Irish. Um, and uh, I think that was all about the, the spread of, of um, Protestantism. Um, but um, I think um, in terms of historically, uh, we did have a wonderful spell where uh, copyright wasn't extended to Ireland. So printing was on a high, obviously not great for the authors, but it was a great time for the printing trade. There's been different moments in history. Um, but in terms of contemporary, which is probably a little bit more what you're asking about here is, um, we're certainly like um, producing some really beautiful print today. And I mentioned three of the kind of leading print um, letterpress printers and, and there are more emerging. The National College 
of art and design here, they teach letterpress printing as part of graphic design and visual communication. So we're producing some really great new talent in this area. Um, I think um, it's probably not as big as it is in the UK and the US, um, but we're certainly um, on that international platform um, and the likes of Mary Plunkett and Jamie Murphy, who I mentioned earlier, they're award winning letterpress printers and they have um, commissions with some of the biggest libraries all over um, the world um, and their work is being collected and I, I do think a lot of it as well has to do with our history of literature here in Ireland and um, the work that they have produced around uh, celebrating literature um, and I suppose that's a really interesting thing about print and just slightly going off the topic there but it, it is so interdisciplinary mm. and I like what I mentioned earlier about like do you have to have an interest in print to like it but no like that connection to literature and um, so we have a lot of people who are interested in English and um uh, the art of the book and you've, you've people interested in all these areas but um, I think uh, the work these letterpress printers are producing today is, is second class and a uh, first class and it's um, it's definitely um, uh, highly regarded as I mentioned earlier they're in this uh, uh, group exhibition over in London this evening so yeah we definitely have a, a good reputation and we try to work on an international level as well I meant in the Creative Europe project we did that allowed us to work with printing museums around Europe. Um, so in particular, we partnered with Labora, which is a paper making museum in Estonia. And that was a really wonderful um, experience to work with someone else who's trying to preserve a traditional craft and paper making is something we would love to include in our new bigger museum as well. So yeah, um, we were also involved in a UK academic um, program that ran last year around, it was called From Craft Technology and Back Again. And that was the whole area we were involved in. In um, We were the only printing museum because they don't have one in the UK. So that's why they extended it to us. And yeah, it was a wonderful opportunity to see what advancements were made. And um, a lot of the universities would have letterpress facilities. So like all the, like the big museum, um, like Trinity had one, but it's just not used. But Oxford, the Bodley, all these libraries they would all have um, letterpress facilities so it's how we can use those in teaching interdisciplinary teachings today. Okay and actually just when you're talking about the relationship between print and technology I actually I saw a question coming in here that kind of asks you know and um, this is someone who's on the Facebook live um, stream with us at the moment and they're kind of saying you know is it fair to say that print media was kind of the power for change in the past in the way that say social media is today with movements such as say the Black Lives Matter that yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good point um, that, that that your viewers made there. Um, it's like, it, yeah, it, it it was bigger um, than, you know, but if you think about like uh, how the message would have got out before, the only way of doing it would have been by um, print. And I think that point really just makes and hones in the importance of the printed word. And there has been no invention like it since. And the, the type of printing I was talking about, letterpress printing, that was the way it was done for 500 years. And that, like, that's an incredible amount of time for your invention to, to not have um, been um, superseded. So it just really shows you how important Gutenberg's invention was. And poor man died, a, a poor man as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so he, he didn't make much uh, from his invention, um, but uh, it's certainly one um, that I think has affected us all in, in, in our lives and the lives of, of, of history gone before us. Yeah, he's definitely um, one of those people who changed the world. And um, like I think you, you kind of you referenced earlier the this notion or this kind of idea of the chapel as the collective um of printers and it's a particularly interesting word because it shows the respect that they view the kind of the craft within and um i'm right in thinking that you have actually either opened or due to open an exhibition which links into this theme yeah so that opened briefly after the first lockdown um, that exhibition um, really uh, I had been working with a few different photographers um, not collectively but they 
one or two had um, been working projects for us and one was working on her own project and just started seeing some beautiful work that they had produced. And um, we were trying to think of ways of acknowledging the chapel. And um, this summer in particular, a lot of them, they had had a really hard time with lockdown. Um, a few of them live on their own and like we, they were really eager to get back to printing. We were really eager to get them back, but we couldn't make it happen. And we were trying to think of ways of really highlighting their work and an exhibition. Uh, it wasn't planned actually before like that long ago, it, like literally I think it opened around, it was to open in March was kind of the idea. Um, and it opened briefly in August, end of July. And um, basically it's an exhibition exploring the chapel. So there's three sections. There's Kate Swift explores the portraiture and the men behind behind the printing and um, uh, Mark Henderson looks at that printing of the proclamation project from 19, 2016 and then Ruth Carden and um, she looks at the hands and the craft and all of her images are up close of the workings of of a craftsman's hand and what I love about it is that there's also um like a female included in that as well and that is one of our skills transfer participants and um, Christine who um, took part in that program and who is learning the craft and helping us to preserve it and pass it on to younger generations so it was uh, it's really nice to see that um, passing on from from the older hand to the young and female hand as well. <laughs> I think the, uh, the symbolic gesture of that kind of transfer from one hand to the other is not lost on us all at this particular moment of time when tactility mm -hmm. is a less pre kind of yeah. prevalent part of our lives but um you kind of it's it's fascinating to hear of how you know your your curatorial programming can be responsive to the world around us and making a positive opportunity out of the circumstances that we're finding ourselves in because i'm right in thinking you also just opened and again i think this had a three-hour run on culture night before we went into our most recent um closure period that you had an exhibition called locked up in lockdown yeah you're dead right so i think i think that's probably the advantage of us like working in small museums that um you know exhibitions we can respond quickly and we don't have to have like necessarily have the three-year lead-in time that some of the larger institutions and the hierarchy that goes along with that so that can be an advantage we have lots of disadvantages but it's certainly an advantage and um, and yet during lockdown i was seeing just incredible work being created on instagram and uh, i just that's the only way i could see it obviously and um Irish uh, or, or, or graphic designers and artists working in Ireland were creating incredible work um, by for about lock, lock, um, uh, lockdown and in every case for charity and it was just so selfless of them doing this incredible work and for really worthwhile charities and I really like some of the themes of the work as well and um, a common theme would be home and our exploration of, of home and um, so we have works from the likes of Mazer and um, Richard Seabrook and a collective and they are really interested in that whole area of home and how our relationship with our homes have changed we used to just use our home for uh, resting eating maybe um entertaining with friends and now we're working in homes we're doing our workouts at home all of these things um, and our relationship has changed so hugely with our home and I really liked that kind of um, immediate reflection on the, the, that, that relationship um, and then um, yeah, there's with Annie Atkins, who I just am a huge fan of hers. She is one of the leading graphic designers for film. Um, so she's worked with Wes Anderson, Steven Spielberg. She's just incredible. And uh, she did with Damn Fine Print a call out for tips of surviving COVID. And um, uh, really like she came up with great things like you know dress for dinner and and that was really interesting because like a couple of our printers had said like Do, we were just wearing our pajamas all day kind of thing you know and yet these kind of tips that people were getting like get dressed up for dinner and and um, th that was really great and and Annie lost her mom during COVID and the proceeds of that went to alone and to the hospice in North Wales that was looking after her mom so um it was just amazing to see these artists that were struggling you know artists as we know from the national campaign for the arts been struggling hugely during this time but we're using their skills to raise money 
for um, really worthwhile causes. The Maser print that we have raised 30,000 for the Matter Foundation. Um, so yeah, it, like incredible stuff. And we just wanted to highlight that. So yeah, that exhibition opened to a very select few on Culture Night for yeah, about three hours. And it just opened yesterday. So um, I would really encourage people to come and see it and um, to, to really experience um, that those reflections on, on what we're living in. And um, just to mention the, the, the name of it, locked up that's a print term so when you when you you lock up the type in a form and you put it to bed so uh, it was just a little play on on that print term okay i um i i will use that phrase next time i'm speaking to our designer and printer and see if they're staring at me going <laughs> very good you're trying to sound on message here um that's to be honest that's incredible i think you kind of it has been quite incredible to see the generosity and the kind of the amount of selfless acts that people are doing to support other organizations and other individuals on a really kind of human to human basis over the past couple of months and it's you know it's really it's inspiring to see what you guys have been doing to support artists to be supporting you know organizations like the matter foundation it's it's that's just amazing it really sincerely fair play it's just such a wonderful thing to see um and I kind of I actually just see a comment uh, coming in here we don't have too much left um but just to kind of answer this question um we've got a woman called Adele writing in saying you know was pr printing controlled in Ireland in the 19th century or was it very easy to get posters and pamphlets printed and um, she's thinking about for example no rent no rent campaigns and so forth yeah so there was um Initially, there was like the king's patent on 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 printing here, um, and there would have only been um, and I suppose just to come to this at the end is probably a very quick just to summarize very quickly. But we have a really good book in our shop called A Brief Printing History of Printing in Ireland, and it actually covers all of this. But yeah, we would have gone through different periods in time where we would have had um, the king's patent um, extended here to Ireland, and uh, we would have had the other period where I mentioned where we would have had copyright waived here. So there have been different moments in, in history, and I think that's probably even a whole talk in itself to get into that um but um uh it's uh, certainly one that we do tap into uh at the museum as well and i think for people like myself it must be said who are now kind of having this kind of hunger to know a little bit more i know you um the print museum has actually taken to the online format like ourselves and you would have um, one of your colleagues giving a lecture um on kind of a slightly more technical aspect in the coming weeks yeah, so next Wednesday afternoon at four o'clock and um, we had to do a little bit earlier in the evening um, I think for our international viewers, but um, Dr. Dermot McGuinn, who is a wonderful uh, historian on the history of printing and in particular on the design of Irish type, um, which is really just fascinating, the whole um, the Irish characters and how they were produced. So he's giving a talk next Wednesday in this similar format to, to what you're using this evening um, on Irish type design and in particular the Rome Irish printing type. Um, so we'd love if you would, if anyone is interested in that a little bit more specifically, um, join us over, over there. That's, um, that sounds fascinating. It sounds thoroughly enjoyable. Um, and I think, shockingly, we've, we've been here for an hour. It's, <laughs> I, I always blink and the hour is up and I still have another 20 questions I want to ask you. But um, I guess I'm going to just end by saying I can't wait to come back in and to visit yourselves. Um, it's been really, it's been really thoroughly enjoyable and interesting to listen to you this evening. So thank you so much for being here and for being so generous in the stories that you've shared with us. Thank you. And to everyone who's thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you. No, very happily. It's been wonderful. And to everyone joining us this evening, thank you all for being here as well. Um, we have another event coming up tomorrow evening. Um, myself and my colleague Trevor are going to be joined in conversation by um, the actor Gabriel Byrne. We're going to be discussing his new book, um, Walking with Ghosts. So I hope you'll join us again Thanks, tomorrow friend. evening. But um, for now, Thank you everyone for joining us for another week of 120 Dublin Stories and Carla, sincerely, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sarah. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>